Good morning. I want to start by thanking this group for being here with me this morning, including General Knight and members of the Vermont National Guard, Dr. Rush and his team from the U.S. Uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, and Mental Health Commissioner Sarah Squirrel, representatives from our hardworking congressional delegation, including John Tracy on behalf of Senator Leahy, uh, Catherine Van Pace on behalf of Senator Sanders, and Ryan McLaren on behalf of Congressman Welch. We're all here today to bring attention to the serious issue of suicide and to share details on what's available for help to those who need it. Because suicide is preventable, and we all have a role in preventing it. Suicide is a public health issue that does not discriminate. It touches people from all walks of life, in every community, and unfortunately, that includes too many of our veterans. This is why General Knight, Dr. Rush, and I have joined together to reach out to Vermont's veterans, service members, and families to ensure they know the resources available to them and their loved ones if they're having thoughts of ending their life. We'll be signing a letter today which provides that information. The message we want to send is that there is hope and there is help. Those who step forward to serve our country are the best amongst us. They often put their lives on hold, get sent thousands of miles away in order for us here at home to be safe and enjoy the freedoms we have. We owe our veterans so much, and that includes providing the support when they return from battle and care and need when they, when they come back home as well. Because we're all in this together, and no one should feel alone in time of crisis. This group will be sharing more details and a list of contacts and resources will be sent with our letter today. And I just want to encourage anyone who is having thoughts of taking their life, or those who know someone in crisis, to use these services. And no, we're here for you. I'll now invite General Knight to share more about the guy's work and preventing this from happening to one of our own. General Knight. Thanks, Governor. Governor, thank you for hosting us here today. And thank you to everybody who made the track. I know the roads can be a little bit of a challenge this time of year. Suicide is a sobering topic, and it's not one that uh, I take lightly. I wish I could say that I'd never known someone that committed suicide, but I can't. I've lost soldiers, friends and colleagues to suicide, and countless others of our brothers and sisters in the Vermont National Guard share similar experiences. I understand this problem is not unique to Vermont, and it's a concern that reaches across all military branches and components. It's important to note, in 2018, the National Guard had a higher suicide rate than any other military component within the Department of Defense. It's unacceptable. One death by suicide is one too many, and we're working to prevent it from happening. Not minimize it, prevent it. We must do better, and we will. We consistently work to communicate available resources to service members, veterans, and their families. As leaders, we must be ready to recognize when someone is in need of help and know how to react. We must see that need and understand it, even when someone may not want to reach out for that help. <coughs> Excuse me. First line supervisors, soldiers, and airmen have and will continue to receive the training necessary to look out for their colleagues. Every soldier is also required to receive resiliency training. This training provides tools to help soldiers cope with difficult situations. It identifies their strengths and weaknesses and helps them to improve their overall mental strength. We do, however, need to improve the availability of resources for those facing challenges. There's much work to do, as Vermont simply does not have a robust network of specialists that focus on post-traumatic stress or adjustment disorder. No one comes back from deployment the same. And those changes impact everybody differently. Our vet centers are a great resource, with one in White River and one in South Burlington. When I returned from Ramadi, Iraq in 2006, that was where I went to work through some of my life-changing experiences. I, the Adjutant General of Vermont, have personally sought help 
to cope with the stress that comes from military service. Seeking help does not make someone weak, and I don't believe it had any bearing on my military career. We need to work hard to eliminate that stigma and recognize that there is no shame in seeking help. I'm here with Lieutenant Trevor Pittock, who's the Vermont National Guard Resilience, Risk Reduction, and Suicide Prevention Coordinator. His team provides multiple resources for those in need, and they're included in the letter that we've drafted for today. Additionally, the National Guard Office of National offers a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. This is not a problem we can fix overnight, and we can't fight this alone. I'm thankful to have such great resources and people, in addition to our own, to help solve this horrible epidemic. For those struggling, I encourage you to reach out for assistance. You have options. Tomorrow won't be the same without you. Now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brett Rush from our White River Junction VA, and I'd like to take the opportunity sir, to thank you very much for what you do for us. First, I just wanted to say thank you to Governor Scott and General Knight for joining me on the stage here today and giving us this opportunity to speak together as a unified voice. As a psychiatrist, I have spent my life working in the realm of suicide and mental illness. Um, it is hard to overstate how unique and special this is to have the VA and the state of Vermont and the Guard and the all standing together in unison with a single voice, bringing a message like this together. Suicide is a national public health issue, and as General Knight just told us, Vermont has more than its fair share of this struggle. The tragedy of suicide is not limited to the person that dies. It affects our families, it affects our towns, it affects our communities. And so this really is something that affects all of us. I believe that Vermont is actually really well equipped to take this issue head on because of the way our communities are constructed. Our communities are tight-knit. We have relationships that are the foundations of these communities. And it is on that foundation that our efforts to eliminate suicide will succeed. We're here together to show you that we care, that treatment is available, and that it works. Over 45,000 Americans died by suicide in 2017, and of that, 6,000 of them were veterans. These are preventable deaths. Suicide prevention is the VA's highest priority. We've made great strides especially in crisis intervention. However, we need to go beyond engaging mental health providers in the community to move forward on this. We need to engage everybody to join together in this mission. We want to reach veterans where they live, where they work, and where they thrive. As a national leader in suicide prevention, and as the nation's largest integrated healthcare system, the VA cannot do this alone. We encourage veterans to seek and use our services and our benefits. However, the reality is maybe 50% of veterans are getting services through the VA. If we want to reach every veteran, we need your help. We need to work together. To serve all veterans, we have to build effective networks of support, communication, and care across the communities in Vermont where veterans live and where they work. And again, this is where I believe that Vermont is uniquely well equipped because of how our communities are built to succeed in this mission. No one organization can tackle veteran suicide alone. To save lives, multiple systems must work in coordinated way to reach veterans. The VA is broadening its efforts, and we need partners from like-minded groups from all sectors, not just healthcare, but also faith-based organizations, 
community organizations, state and local governments to work with us in reaching all veterans wherever they may be. Coordinated resources across our state will help to prevent these tragic deaths. As the 86th Infantry Brigade Combat Team begins ramping up for their likely 2021 deployment, please know that we are here as an additional resource to support soldiers and their families. Before our next speaker, Megan Snicken, a Suicide Prevention Coordinator from White River Junction, takes the podium, I want to leave you with one final remark. We are here today, united for you, the state of Vermont. Together, we will be an example of how a community prevents suicide. Thank you, Governor Scott, General Knight, and Dr. Rush. I'm honored to be here today to talk about suicide prevention and the VA and its resources. As the previous speakers have said, suicide prevention is a public health issue that we're dealing with across the state and in our own communities, and it's affecting veterans in our own states. As Dr. Rush mentioned, suicide prevention is a top priority for the VA, and on average, across our country, we lose about 6,000 veterans a year to suicide. So here in Vermont, I want you to know that the VA is here as a resource and as um, a community partner in this effort to prevent suicide. So I want to just mention a few things about the VA. Um, as Dr. Rush said, it's an integrated healthcare system. I like to think about it as a holistic healthcare system. We don't just serve your medical needs and your mental health needs, but we, we have a social mission. We work on things such as housing and transportation, financial resources, employment, peer support services, um, these are all very important to us and very important um, to serve the whole person um, so that they can have um, positive coping skills and move forward in their life. Additionally, we have an entire suicide prevention team and um, as Dr. Rush said, I'm the suicide prevention coordinator for the VA. I coordinate services, I provide education, I work with you all um, in the community. We have a dedicated team of case managers um, at the VA who are there to provide ongoing support and resources to you, to our veterans, um, to their families. They reach out to families, they reach out to veterans to keep in touch, to keep them connected. They help coordinate their care, um, all the services they need to live a healthy and productive life. Additionally, the VA has seven outpatient clinics, five of which are spread across the state of Vermont. They're in your communities, close to where you are. Um, they provide many of the services that I mentioned earlier, um, in addition to walk-in mental health services. So that's one of the things that I want to, um, to say is that we have um, easy access to care. You do not need an appointment um, to get mental health services. And I'm gonna give you a number that you can walk in, but the best way and the easiest way to get connected is to call 802-295. 9363 extension 6961. Um, we screen for suicide at all access points in the VA. So if um, a veteran were to come in and end up in our emergency department or on one of our inpatient units, um, we screen for suicide. We think that's extremely important so that the veterans can get connected to the care and resources that they need. Um, additionally, we've been um, expanding access to care um, to, to a program called VA Video Connect, which is essentially a program where veterans can be in the comfort of their own home or in their car or on vacation and they can connect with their providers um, through their smart device or through their computer. Um, and I also want to share that, and I believe that General Knight mentioned this, but um, the VA has a 24-7 365 days a year, Veterans and Military Crisis Line and Text Line. This is a wonderful resource for veterans who are struggling, family members who are concerned, um, community members who need support and consultation and resources. Um, that number is 1-800-273-8255, and you would press one to reach the Veterans and Military Crisis Line. They also have a text option um, and that number is 
255. And I'll share that um, the Veterans and Military Crisis Line um, has a very strong connection with the VA medical centers and outpatient clinics. And if somebody's calling that crisis line and they feel like they need to get connected to care or they need follow-up even if they're not connected to the VA, um, we get a message at our VA and me and my team follow up with um, those veterans or family members directly. Um, and lastly, this was mentioned earlier, but I just really want to share that partnerships is a critical piece of this approach to care. As partners, we're able to expand our reach and deliver care and support to veterans where they live, work, and thrive. Why is this important? Because we have 20 million veterans nationwide, and only about 30% of those veterans are accessing VA health care. This makes it, makes it extremely challenging for the VA to identify veterans who may be at risk for suicide and to connect them with mental health care, peer networks, employment, and other resources to help with coping and restore a sense of purpose. So we know that reaching beyond the VA system of care and into the communities is one of the key ways that we can support all at-risk veterans, families, and caregivers across the state. So we need to partner with you, with veterans, with caregivers, with family members, with community organizations, state and local government, as we're doing here today, to reach all the veterans across the state of Vermont. We need all of your support and collaboration so together we can and we will save veterans' lives. Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce Vietnam veteran John Tracy from Senator Leahy's office, who will now say a few words on behalf of the Senator. Good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of Senator Lee in appreciation of the combined effort and that we're taking on suicide prevention as a public health issue. When you enter the military, your life changes. When you go to basic training, you're already in the subsection of society that the general population really has no idea. When you're deployed, you experience things that you just don't experience as part of the general population. When you're deployed to a combat zone, it's a different lens depending on what you do when you're in that combat zone, it's a different lens. And the transition back is hard for people. Your lens and how you view the world is a perspective that the general population doesn't have. The additional challenge we have in the National Guard in particular is while we don't have a major military installation in Vermont, where other states do, I remember seeing uh, when they came back from Afghanistan after the families, the troops gathered, they departed, they got into their individual cars and drove, literally drove off into the midst. They didn't have a compound they were going to. Now, we, the delegation has worked very hard with the Guard and the military to work on how to inter reintegrate troops when we get back from deployment, spend time, trying to find out, do an evaluation, see what's going on. But when you go home to the private life in your community with your family, it's a different world. And so the fact that there's a focus on the prevention is significant. Senator Leahy has worked to direct funding to the National Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, which is located at the VA Medical Center campus down White River Junction, where they're working on evidence based practices to help treat people with PTSD, including funding for a brain bank. As often is the case, there are medical advancements made on the battlefield that have benefits to the civilian population down the road. This will be another example of the fact that we're identifying veterans, but for the broader population. And so, on behalf of Senator Lee, thank you very much for this combined effort, putting a face on it. And we all have what work we can do. It's how we treat each other as young kids, as young adults, as seniors. A lot of this interaction from us, a small state, there are only two or three degrees of separation on a good day. That's a benefit for us. But thank you for this combined effort. We appreciate it. And I'd like to introduce Catherine Becker Andrews. Thank you, John. Thank you, Governor, um, and everyone else who's here today. Um, on behalf of Senator Sanders, I just want to highlight the importance of this conversation that we're having here today. Uh, back in 2007, Senator Sanders saw this need that John was just describing about our Vermont Guard members coming home and dispersing to every corner of the state. And working with um, the TAG at the time created the Vermont Veterans Outreach Program. We have a couple members of that team here today. They are a phenomenal resource that I just want to mention. They are folks who can go into the homes of our veterans, our guard members, and talk to them where they're at. Um, I know from their stories, they have literally stopped potential suicides with a gun on the table. And their work is so critical, which is why Bernie has always fought to continue that funding year after year in Congress, and we look forward to continuing to do so 
for years to come and making sure that more states have this same resource. Um, I would also say that we know how important it is to have the data from the VA on suicide. One of the best ways that we can do pre prevention is to know what we've seen in the past. And one of the things that the most recent national report on suicide shows is that one of the groups at the highest risk for suicide are members of the National Guard who have never deployed. Think about that. Members of the National Guard who have never deployed. That means because of Congress's rules, they are not eligible to receive care from the VA. In Vermont, we are working hard to find ways to bridge those gaps for those folks and get them to care. And it's one of the things that Bernie is working on in Congress with both DOD and VA to make sure our Guard members who go through training shoulder to shoulder with their colleagues who have deployed have the same resources available to them. As we prepare for deployment, it's also absolutely critical that our community mental health providers are able to sign up for TRICARE so that those mental health providers can see our Guard members as they get ready to deploy. Having those resources in the community, in addition to the resources at the VA, will make sure that access is available when it's needed. Um, I want to commend the VA for their tremendous mental health access. It is some of the best in the country, not just in the VA, but in any healthcare system in this country. It is absolutely phenomenal that you can walk in and get the care you need. And in Congress, Bernie is working hard to make sure that the VA has all the resources it needs to meet the promises that we've made to the members of our military and to our veteran community, including the families. I just want to close with one request because we have so many members of the press here today. There are guidelines put out by the VA and by the CDC in terms of how to talk about suicide. This is all evidence-based research that's very important in helping make sure that we talk about suicide and deaths by suicide in the right way. Um, this is evidence-based, scientific, federally funded research. Please use it to make sure that your reporting is done in an accurate, factual way that makes sure that we help prevent suicides. So on behalf of Senator Sanders, thank you to everyone for being here today. Thank you, Governor, Abbott in general, Dr. Rush, Megan, my colleagues in the delegation. This is really an impressive effort that we're all here together on behalf of such an important issue. It's my now pleasure to turn it over to Ryan McLaren from Congressman Peter Welch's office. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I think uh, Governor Scott mentioned two reasons why we're here today. And the first is health. Um, and it's ha actually fairly serendipitous that I'm here today, because in just a few hours, the House Committee on Veterans Affairs will be taking up the Improved Wellbeing for Veterans Act, which is aimed at utilizing a public health approach to help connect veterans with existing community resources in an effort to provide key services before a veteran reaches a point of crisis. So this bill is really written to address a lot of what Dr. Rush is talking about. Connecting veterans with resources already available in the community and strengthen coordination and capacity of community-based organizations that veterans serve. So we'll be doing outreach to community members to get feedback on this bill, but this is exactly the sort of community-based and public health-based approach that Peter has supported throughout his career and is critical to rural communities in Vermont and across the country. So we really need to be reaching into, reaching, be, we need to be all in reaching out to veterans and addressing their needs at any opportunity. So with the VA's leadership and with partners across the state, many of which are in this room, uh, we hope to reach veterans where they are and prevent tragedies of hopelessness and isolation that befall way too many veterans. But the second reason we're here that Governor Scott mentioned, um, and I think the most important reason, is hope. Um, it's to honor the service and sacrifice of our veterans. I really feel like it's our duty as civilians to bear witness to their experiences and 
make sure they know how much we value their commitment to us and that that commitment will be reciprocated in kind. So what I want to say from Peter is that you're not alone. And I want to say thank you to Governor Scott, to Adjutant General Knight, and to everyone else here for spreading that message today and every day. Thank you. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. If we could stick to on topic first, and then I think there are any, uh, other questions you might want to ask. Uh, but if we could do those first, I'd appreciate it. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rush, you mentioned uh, uh, faith based organizations. Uh, as we head into the holidays, uh, for times for families, and also uh, perhaps more connection with churches, what can faith based organizations do to? help you help veterans? So specifically as it relates to what we're talking about today, which right. is the risk of suicide and that tragedy, yes. the, the, the driving factor in suicide in many cases, if not most cases, is loneliness and isolation. <laughs> Faith-based communities are perfectly suited to help veterans see the extent to which they are not alone and that they are part of a community. And those are, those are powerful communities that carry a tremendous amount of meaning um, in people's lives. And to see one's connection and that you are not isolated through the caring of a faith-based organization is a tremendously powerful response to that feeling. Other questions? It, it seems like way back when, when all the decade or more ago, when all the soldiers were coming back from when the deployments were on the top of our mind, I know there were so many programs like this that I remember being talked about. Not uh, too many to even be specific, but did those work? And are they still in practice? Are they still being used? That I don't know a little bit of, um, I can speak to my, my personal experience. Um, we got back, it was very difficult to get soldiers who just returned to speak about their experiences. Um, so the guidance that we received from Colonel Coffin, who was our, our state psychiatrist at the time, um, who was very gracious in, in sitting us down, knowing what we've been through. Um, it wasn't a formal program, but he encouraged us to keep an eye on each other, keep an eye on ourselves, and know that it manifests differently in everybody. Uh, and you wouldn't see things for five or six months down the road. I think what we've done since then, and of course my, my experience is dated at this juncture, I think we've, we've just made exponential leaps forward um, with communicating all the resources, our outreach specialists, um, within family programs, the VA, our vet centers, um, and we're going to continue that. I think it, down to communication, ensuring people know there is hope and they have an avenue uh, for assistance. Uh, General, on that, on that issue as a veteran, and there, there are several of them. We always talk, the guys who aren't talking are the guys that saw the most action or saw the really bad stuff. And it's the same with the guys that have come back. Um, and they're pretty stubborn. How do you how do you crack that nut? I think we need more people to be the example, um, and if I can be that example, I will. I will share my experiences. Uh, as I said before, there's no shame in it. You've got to get rid of that stigma. 
um, and ensure, at least within our own organization, that when somebody seeks help, it doesn't have an impact, a negative impact on them. And, and we give them the options they need to seek the help that they require. Um, that's our responsibility. We've asked a lot of folks, and, and I would go back to what um, Katie said about the number of suicides that happen in the veterans, National Guard veterans in particular, that haven't been um, we've got to get after that as well because being in the guard is different and we ask a lot of folks and they have pressures outside the guard um, and being in the guard is, is at times stressful we ask a lot of folks so we need to give them all the assistance and resources they need to make sure they know how to communicate with them. any other on topic with that they want to they want to move off to the side <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, uh, late yesterday, your Secretary of Human Services uh, said that you had instructed him to thoroughly investigate um, allegations that some days published uh, about the Chimney Regional Correctional Facility. I wonder if you could describe in more detail um, what precisely it is you are hoping the Secretary will do, what is the nature of this investigation, how long do you hope it will take, what um, uh, specific things you hope you will look at. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for investigating and writing the article. Um, I read the article, uh, was alarming um, and uh, eye-opening, and, uh, and I felt uh, that there was enough evidence there that we needed to move forward and do something. So uh, having a new secretary on board uh, with, uh, with his uh, background and turnaround operations and so forth, uh, I thought he was the right person to take a look and gather facts and see where we go from here. Um, I'm hoping that, that this won't take long. Uh, and when I say not long, uh, I would hope within the next couple of weeks uh, we come to some conclusion as to where we go next. The Attorney General uh, reached out this morning as well, offered his assistance in working together on this. Uh, inevitably, I, I believe that there's going to be enough evidence here uh, that we're going to have to, to move forward with something. Uh, so, uh, so his assistance is uh, greatly appreciated, uh, and I, I'm sure we'll be working together, as well as with the legislature, when we come back in January, if there's anything that we need to do uh, in that regard. Uh, but uh, whether it's personnel, uh, whether it's procedure, uh, there are things that uh, I believe that we'll have to change in the future based on what I read. Such as what? Well, I don't know yet. We have to gather the facts, uh, make sure that we, we know where we're going. Uh, and, uh, and then take, take the actions uh, needed. Uh, and, and, you know, there's all kinds of things that the article brought up, uh, and, I, and I thought it was, uh, again, uh, interesting, uh, and, uh, and we're taking this very seriously, uh, and I guarantee we'll get to the bottom of it, uh, because it's unacceptable. You receive weekly reports from your cabinet members, um, pretty detailed ones. Uh, have you ever heard any of these allegations, uh, any of these uh, things have been reported to you in the yeah. time I, I have not, um, and uh, that's concerning as well. And so that's one of the areas uh, we want to make sure that we get uh, get to the root, at the bottom of this, uh, so that we can we can take action uh, to make sure that I'm getting the information that I need in order to make the changes that I think will be necessary. Uh, I want to read you, if I could. I apologize for uh, springing this on you, but I just received it um, about an hour ago. Um, this is a, a, a copy of a formal complaint that was filed by a corrections officer directly to Mike Touchette, who at the time was Deputy Commissioner um, in uh, June 2017. Um, and it's a lengthy report. I, I certainly won't read the whole thing. I'll forward it to your staff afterward. Um, in this report, um, the corrections officer alleges to the Deputy Commissioner multiple instances of suspected retaliation um, against guards for reporting various things the facility. Um, and I'm going to just read one specific thing as it relates to um, a focus of the story, the alleged action of Daniel Zorzi, the second shift supervisor who um, guards and inmates say was using drugs on duty uh, for years. Um, this person, this corrections officer, reported again to Mike Touchette in June 2017. Um, Several second shift staff have noticed a huge increase in corrective action being taken against them that correspond with making allegations of the second shift supervisor using cocaine and Ritalin while running shift. Staff have reported seeing white powder around the brim of his nose and behavior consistent with the use of stimulants. When officers initially approached myself and the other stewards about the observations, 
We reported to management on their behalf. Uh, and management, uh, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent at the time, advised us to have the staff report the incident. Personally, said they were not a violation of mandatory reporting policy. It goes on um, a bit longer, but uh, essentially it alleges the people who reported that behavior, that suspected behavior, were retaliated against for reporting it. Um, what do you make of that, um, given that the person who received this report is now your corrections committee? Yeah, well again, concerning. Uh, we want to investigate this, uh, get to the, to the facts and find out if uh, anything, what action was taken as a result of, uh, of situations such as that. Um, but, uh, but I can assure you, I, I had not received any weekly report uh, with any of that information. Do you still have confidence in the commissioner? Well, again, we'll go uh, through and gather the facts. Uh, we'll learn a lot over the next uh, two to three weeks, and uh, we'll make determinations at that point. Some prosecutions uh, uh, against former corrections officers at that facility um, have fallen apart um, for multiple reasons. We don't always know why. That it seems that it may have to do with um, whether the victim was, the alleged victim was able to testify. In one case recently, uh, just last week, uh, prosecution was dropped uh, because the alleged victim died of an overdose. Um, do you believe that any action should be taken in the law enforcement realm? Um, against these officers who have not been fully prosecuted? Um, that's something that I'll be talking with the Attorney General about, uh, but personally, uh, I believe that uh, we should continue to, to make the case uh, so that uh, the general public is uh, protected uh, and action is taken. But, but again, I, I don't know uh, about that particular uh, issue, uh, but, uh, but that's something that I'll be talking to the Attorney General about. The Chittenden County State's Attorney said yesterday that she plans to review the sentences of all the uh, inmates serving that facility who her office has sent uh, to the facility, um, and she may seek to uh, reduce their sentences uh, if she deems that appropriate. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's perfectly appropriate uh, to go back and take a look at some of those cases, uh, including I think she had a couple of uh, the correctional officers as well that, that were dismissed. Uh, taking a look at those, uh, as well as the, those uh, females who are incarcerated, to make sure that when they're under the uh, supervision of uh, the, uh, the Department of Corrections, uh, that there wasn't anything that would uh, prevent them from coming forward or um, in, in terms of their rehabilitation uh, affecting that in any way. So um, I think it's appropriate for them to take a look. Do you believe that the employment requirements for corrections officers in Vermont are appropriate? Um, for one thing, uh, there are no drug tests required of COs. Yeah, I thought that was, again, something that I learned from, from your article. I didn't know that uh, previous to that. Um, it's something that uh, we'll take a look at. I'd like to see what other states do um, so that uh, we make sure that we have uh, the best uh, there uh, that, are, that are overseeing our offender population. Does that mean you support I, I would like to see what other states do, uh, but I was surprised to see that it wasn't there, and I'm not sure why. And, and that's part of why one of the areas that I'd like uh, Mike to take a look at as well, uh, to see how we uh, stack up against other states and why we don't have uh, some of those, those provisions. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's two separate issues from my standpoint. Uh, I still believe the, the facility is outdated. Uh, we need to move forward with something at some point. Um, but we're looking at different models. Uh, we've looked at a, a model in Maine, a step-down kind of uh, facility, as well as Connecticut. Uh, and, uh, and we'll take a look and see where that goes. Uh, but they are two separate issues. Uh, I wouldn't want to use this as a reason to move forward with a new uh, facility because that's not the problem. Uh, I would say it's more of a personnel problem and, and maybe uh, a, a adjudication problem. Final question for me, and I swear I'll let other people ask questions, but, um, and, and this is actually more of a statement. A number of the people that I've spoken to um, about the situation, inmates and guards who are still working there, um, are quite fearful of being retaliated against for speaking to the press um, about this, about these matters. Um, what, what can you do to ensure that there is no further retaliation or retribution um, against both employees and inmates? Yeah, I think it's important as we move forward um, to set up some sort of a, a, a of a, of a way uh, for people uh, to voice their opinions uh, anonymously in some way, uh, because when they're reporting to their superiors, uh, that doesn't always uh, get to uh, the conclusion that 
that I think is uh, is appropriate. So um, we will we we have this. Um, we're going to make sure uh, that nobody is retaliated against. Uh, we're going to pay attention uh, to this, and we'll get to the bottom of it. You will personally ensure that nobody is. I, I will personally ensure that anyone come, that comes forward with factual information on this uh, is there is no retribution. What's happening today to human resources? Uh, sorry, to human services to ensure that. Well, again, you know, we're in this first 24 hours here. Uh, I right. would get, the next first 24 hours. Right. What's happening right now? Yeah, I, I'm, Commissioner or Secretary Smith uh, is probably. I'm hoping we'll take action on this. He has his plate full, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, again uh, that this doesn't continue. Uh, and then we do, uh, again, uh, research as to how we got to the business we're in today. Uh, so I'm sure he's taking uh, appropriate action to be sure uh, that this isn't happening as we speak. He's happening under the watch of the agency of human services, under the watch of your governorship, yep. previous governorships. Yep. Why should you get confidence in an internal probe that's being well, taken yeah. by the same people who are yeah. in control when all is happening? Yeah, I, and I understand that. And, I, and this is just the first step. Maybe uh, this may lead us uh, to a uh, another, um, like a blue ribbon commission of some sort. I don't know, uh, but uh, but I uh, understand. We have to first uh, understand what's happening, and then determine what steps we take next, which may include uh, some sort of a, a neutral uh, body that would take a look at this uh, to give everyone uh, the, the the sense of uh, trust in the government, so to speak. But, but first of all, we, we need to figure this out uh, and make sure that it's not continuing to happen. What were your specific directions to my uh, Get to the bottom of this. Um, this is unacceptable. If your investigation verifies the allegations it's reporting, uh, are you going to still have any confidence in the current leaders of of, of well, prison that's, I mean, we should step back. And I, and I read uh, a couple of the comments uh, on the article, and there was one person who was, uh, who was incarcerated and talked about, uh, or previously incarcerated, and talked about uh, the fact that there are uh, some good uh, COs, uh, correctional officers, and some bad. Um, but we don't want to throw everyone out with this. We have good people there, and we have some bad ones as well, apparently. And that's what we want to, to find out, who the bad ones are, and make sure that we prevent them from continuing in that position. Um, so we need, it's on us, uh, to reinstill the faith and trust uh, people should have uh, in any government agency. Uh, and this one in particular is something that we're, we're paying attention to as we speak. This is going on under the leadership of people at the top of the Well, again, we'll, we'll see uh, when we, we take a look at this uh, as to how far this went, and we'll go from there. Another topic. Do you think the president should be in I, I've said before um, that I think there should be a process, uh, and uh, they've opened this process up. I thought it should be transparent, and they're doing that uh, at this point in time. It appears the House uh, will will uh, take a vote on impeachment. I would imagine uh, that this will this will happen in the next few weeks. But we have a long ways to go. Uh, I look forward to the to the Senate, uh, their hearings, and and how that will go uh, from there. Uh, and uh, determine, you know, from my standpoint, uh, I think uh, I think the, the president uh, took some steps that were inappropriate, and and I think it's up to the Senate uh, after the House takes the action that I think they will. Uh, to investigate further and uh, convince us, the general public, as to what should happen from there. So do you think we should be I, After the uh, Senate hearings, I'll continue to watch. But the House will be? Well, they, they bring the allegations uh, and they cite uh, the, the president in some respects, and then, uh, and then it goes on to a trial after that. So I, I don't want to get ahead of the trial. You've uh, you appointed a new Supreme Court justice today. Um, you, in the past, have criticized the judicial nominating board for failing to send enough um, female candidates uh, for the judiciary. Um, I'm struck by the fact that, uh, in appointing a male, you've returned the court to a uh, male-dominated body. Um, can you address that? Yeah. Um, well, uh, first of all, I want to give uh, great credit to the judicial nominating board. Uh, they've, uh, they've turned the corner in a, a lot of respects. We're seeing a very diverse uh, group of candidates uh, at this point in time. 
Um, it should be noted, uh, just last month, I, I appointed two uh, Superior Court judges who were female. Uh, and, uh, and, and we had some great candidates uh, in this, uh, this round for Supreme Court justice. It wasn't easy. Uh, a lot of good, qualified candidates came forward. Um, but I had to, at the end of the day, I had to pick the person that I thought uh, had uh, the background, the temperament, and, uh, and, and was connected enough to Vermont uh, to, to do this in this position at this point in time. And I thought uh, Judge Cohen uh, was the appropriate person. What, what is it about Cohen's uh, philosophy, judicial philosophy? That He's just a common uh, type of person. Uh, he, uh, he explains things well uh, so the average Vermonter can understand it. And I think uh, that his upbringing uh, in the Rutland area uh, and his, uh, again, his humbleness, uh, I think, will suit uh, him well in this, uh, this role as Supreme Court Justice. Justice. He doesn't take himself um, uh, as being any better than anyone else, uh, and I think that's important for anyone in a position of power. It's interesting. You just um, cited largely uh, personal characteristics. Nothing about his legal record. Um, is that is that? Well, he's been important? he's been a judge uh, that's been well respected for over twenty years. But I'm just in, in describing your process. Um, our personal um, attributes, uh, the way people should act themselves, where they're from. That's that's that's, that's, that's part of it. Here. You know, I've, uh, you probably heard my four C's, right? I've heard uh, your four C's. All right. So I mean, that's what I use when I when I try and hire anyone uh, and uh, and look to, to see if they have the talent and the capability needed. And, and they have to be, uh, they have to have that character and integrity, they have to be competent, um, and, and they have to be committed to the process. It's, it's difficult being uh, a judge of any sort, and particularly a street court a justice. Uh, but then they have to have the chemistry, uh, the chemistry needed uh, for the team that they're going to be a part of, uh, and be independent enough, but yet, at the same time, uh, see the, uh, what the court needs, uh, what the, the judicial uh, um, um, system needs, uh, because they oversee that. So I thought he, he had uh, 20 years of experience uh, in the uh, in this, uh, Superior Court. And, uh, and again, I thought uh, he had all the legal uh, background and all the attributes and, and the other, I mean, he had even, uh, a, he has a degree in, in, in uh, environmental uh, studies of some sort, and I thought that was uh, that was good as well. I thought that was uh, an attribute. We heard this morning about the one type of preventable death. I want to ask you about another, uh, those in uh, Vermont's uh, other care homes. Uh, last week, seven days, and GPR uh, published findings from an investigation based primarily on state and records, and those records show uh, dozens of instances of harm, abuse, and neglect in these uh, state-regulated facilities, as well as these five preventable uh, deaths in the last five years, and scores of homes that have failed to meet some basic regulations designed to protect residents, like uh, conducting background checks before you hire an employee. Uh, yet the state will mean, uh, state regulators only check in on these homes once every two years, even as they are uh, enabled to watch over some of the most frail people in the state, who hundreds who would qualify for nursing homes. And uh, even in the vast majority of even repeat violations are going unpunished, unfined, or, or otherwise unsanctioned in the summers. Uh, I'm wondering if any of this is surprising to you and what you, uh, if anything, you plan to do. Well, I know we're, we're struggling in the state on many different uh, perspectives. Our demographics are shifting. We're getting older. Uh, there are more people in care than ever before. We're struggling to find uh, the help needed uh, to, uh, to be a part of, the, of these uh, facilities. Um, so uh, I, um, I'm, I, again, disappointed, um, maybe not as surprised, uh, but, uh, but as well, I haven't uh, circled around with our, our uh, folks at AHS to determine what the steps are next in trying to make sure that we, we protect the most vulnerable, uh, the seniors that have given so much to us. Do you think the state can do better on this part? Uh, obviously, uh, we, we can. Um, I mean, we should, um, because uh, we have an obligation uh, to make sure that we protect those uh, uh, across the board, from honors of all, all uh, walks of life. And our seniors are, are amongst the most vulnerable. Do you think uh, this is worthy of uh, consideration of additional funding, whether to uh, so regulators can go more frequently? Or We'll determine that. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be provisions that uh, move forward uh, with the legislature, work together uh, in, in order to provide the, uh, the oversight needed.
it sounds kind of passive, especially when you compare it to what you were just saying about the part of corrections. I mean, it's, the reporting that, that, that DPR in seven days yeah. did um, found that there were at least five preventable deaths um, in the period that they were looking at. I, I would say it's a much different situation. Uh, we have a, a people in power uh, that are using their power uh, to uh, to take advantage of someone in their uh, in their uh, um, in their confines, and I think it's a, a totally different situation uh, than in our uh, some of our elder care facilities. But are you going to take action? Well, we're, obviously we'll take action, but but this uh, the, the story that came out yesterday uh, about uh, the abuse of power uh, in some of these uh, these facilities is concerning to me. I don't see the same abuse of power in some of our elder care uh, facilities. You said you were concerned but not surprised about the findings in elder care? Only, only because Why? we have so many people. Our demographics, again, are shifting. And as I stated before, we're having trouble I have hiring uh, people in, uh, in all different sectors of Vermont, uh, that, in, that included. Uh, so now I know they're struggling uh, in that respect. Um, so uh, we need to do better. Uh, I didn't, we're trying to do whatever we can to, to attract more people to the state, uh, and we're trying to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that we protect uh, people. But we'll, we'll, uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, steps that will need to be taken uh, in order to do so. Are you willing to expand uh, the Division of Licensing Protection's authority to issue sanctions or fines? I mean, we, we tally 150 repeat problems at homes, and yeah, the state has only issued six fines for about $8,000 in the last five years. Uh, is that something you're willing to take a look at, or do you think uh, Obviously, we'll take a look at anything that will help uh, rectify the situation. I mean, I, 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 I get a, you know, I get a fine for, failing, for getting a quarter you know, in a meter on the street, because uh, homes who let down these residents usually face yeah. no such penalty as that. You, you, I mean, we are, we are not uh, uh, fearful of, of uh, penalizing people in the state uh, with fines uh, in all different areas. So um, I would be surprised to see that there isn't uh, fines that are, are being uh, uh, issued. Do you think the state... Uh, isn't, I think Derek is just telling you that they're not. I know. Right? I know. So, and, I'm say, and I'm saying that we haven't, uh, I haven't looked into that enough to know. Uh, whether we uh, we have or should or, or, or haven't followed through or what the what the issue is, but I haven't done that. Um, the state house leaders say they're going to send you a minimum wage for you know life and a man for a day to leave the building and all that. Learn how to pay taxes and protect the law. But if that means your hopefully your response will be to those things. Well, I, again, probably no different than uh, before. I, I believe that uh, um, supply and demand will work in terms of the minimum wage. Uh, I think they already have an effect on wages, uh, that we don't, uh, we don't need to artificially raise the, uh, the minimum wage. We're already one of the highest in the, in the country at this point in time. Uh, we have a, a state right next door that has a, has a minimum wage of 725, uh, and uh, their economy is uh, doing quite well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the paid family leave, I think we both, uh, we, we all agree uh, that this would be helpful. I have a different approach, and I believe a voluntary approach is the first step necessary. It could, uh, it could create the, uh, the structure needed uh, as we move forward, Would, whatever we do, even if it's in the future they determine it to be mandatory. Uh, I believe that uh, this is the right approach. So uh, I'm going to continue to work with them, uh, trying to, to argue our point, uh, convince them uh, that this is a better step in the right direction without uh, a payroll track tax that could be anywhere from 20 to 50 million, or 20 to $80 million uh, for paid family leave when we are already seeing pressures in so many different areas, whether it's in education, uh, you know, another 80 to $100 million uh, of, uh, of new expenses in education as our as our student population continues to drop. I mean, this sets the stage for what kind of session? Well, probably no different than any others. Um, we have our differences of opinion. Uh, we'll try and work through them as best we can. We'll disagree on on many. I'll look for opportunities to work together uh, on uh, common goals. So that sounds like they've settled. Leadership is settled on a minimum wage increase in the $12 to $13 range. Before we were talking about $15. Is 
any mandated increase in the minimum wage or not starter fee? Again, we'll take a look at whatever they pass. Uh, I haven't seen anything uh, in writing at this point. I haven't seen either body um, uh, that uh, that has uh, agreed to that. So we'll take a look. Your tax commission is forecasting a six percent increase in property tax rates next year. Uh, will we see any proposals from you to reduce or eliminate? Yeah, based on, on projections as we see them today. That's what, uh, that's what the letter is uh, um, statutorily obligated to do. Um, you know, I, I vetoed three budgets over property taxes uh, over the last uh, three years. Um, so suffice it to say, uh, I'm sensitive uh, to property tax rate increases. Um, I've offered, we've taken different approaches. Uh, in the first year, we had uh, we tried to, to force through something that uh, they weren't willing to do. Uh, in the second year, uh, we had a whole list of, uh, of uh, different approaches that we would like them to consider, uh, and that didn't work. Um, so I need a willing partner. Uh, we're, we're willing to have the conversation. I, I believe we're going in the wrong direction. We're spending over a, a billion seven now, or, or probably over a billion eight uh, at this point uh, for education for about... Uh, 75,000 kids. Um, so we have a uh, structural problem on our hands uh, that needs to be addressed. And we can't continue. Even with everything that's been done uh, in terms of finding different alternatives to the property tax uh, increases, uh, you know, sales and use and, and so forth, um, and, and even with the grand list growing uh, because of all the new building and improvements that we're doing across the state, I think that in itself, the, the grand list is growing by uh, $50 million. So that should take care of uh, the ongoing increased expense, but it's not. Uh, so that's why the property tax uh, rate uh, will increase if we do nothing. And I just think that we can do better. Uh, but I need them to work with me in order to do so. So will we see a specific proposal? Uh, you know, I think there are going to be uh, this, some of the same proposal we've seen before. Health care is one area uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that is uh, is concerning. Uh, I think that's driving uh, some of the increase, not all of it. I think the inefficient system is really uh, the culprit. Um, but uh, but we have some ideas. But again, they have to be willing to uh, to work with us on that. I, I can't drive this. Obviously, I've tried that uh, th three times. Uh, so we'll do what we can uh, to work with them uh, to try and give some relief to Vermonters. And back to the Derek's line of question. One of the other issue, I just want to be clear on that. Is there a plan of action right now in your administration to address some of the issues that we're covering in the investigation? We, I, I am not aware of what we're doing, and I'm, but I'm confident that we're doing something. Uh, but I haven't addressed that uh, personally myself at this point in time. Uh, this week, uh, there's two juveniles that are back in Woodside after the uh, home invasion. Um, do you still stand by your administration's uh, proposal to, to shut down Woodside? Yeah, uh, well, again, it's a, it's a facility uh, that is uh, geared towards having a population of 30. Um, and uh, so the problems still exist. Uh, so we're, we're, that's an area that I think uh, th that we'll work, be able to work with the legislature on. I think we're, we're both at the, uh, at the point where we think the Woodside should close. Uh, maybe not everyone, uh, but uh, many in, in positions of leadership have uh, signaled that they, they think we have to do something. So we're willing to work with them on that. But we have to take some other approach. I mean, we, have, we, have, we do have need in the state. I have not. I have not spoken to Commissioner Touche. At, at, you mean in the last 24 hours? Yes. No, I have not. Does he remain on the ground? He does. Vermont's uh, Department of Motor Vehicles has been making a lot of money selling personal information. Uh, do you support that practice? Well, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, some of it uh, is in statute, actually, uh, interestingly enough. Um, we, uh, uh, I did uh, take some action last week and told them uh, to stop uh, with uh, uh, private investigators accessing that, inf uh, that information. Uh, so we put a hold on that for now. That seems to be uh, the biggest sticking point. Uh, the rest is, is some from insurance companies and so forth and determining rates and they have to, to make sure that uh, uh, those uh, with licenses uh, agree to that uh, before they can access the information. So some of it's in statute. There's no choice. Um, but uh, I, I am a little concerned about privacy. 
uh, in the private investigators is an area that I think we should step, take a step back and take a look at. So I told them to uh, to stop that practice. Why does that concern you? Well, it's just that uh, you, you know I'm not sure what they use the information for, uh, and I just think it's an area that uh, that we should just you know uh, let's uh, let's take a step back and take a look and make sure we know what we're doing with that. Uh, and, and talk with the legislature to see where we want to go from there. Besides private investigators, there are other corporations that receive this information for that are not insurance companies. Um, are you interested in reviewing this practice holistically? I'm sure it will uh, lead to that, uh, but, but the private investigators was an area that I was most concerned with. Uh, you've already started fundraising for 2020. Uh, can we expect an announcement soon? Are you planning on announcing uh, I'll be I'll be making that determination in the spring after the legislature is uh, out of session, um, but uh, but I always want to be prepared. You never know, so we, uh, we want to get started whenever we can. People who are not running for election don't raise money. Oh, I don't know that for for sure, but no? I, I haven't seen any data on that. Senator Baruch, he's going to be uh, introducing legislation banning semi-automatic uh, firearms in some public spots. Um, <laughs> What are your thoughts on? Yeah, well, we'll we'll see. I mean, I I think we've uh, we've taken a lot of steps in this regard over the last few years, as you might recall. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to do uh, take the laws that we passed, make them uh, better, and make sure that we're we're putting them into practice and uh, and and making sure that we're educating people on how to use uh, particularly the red flag laws. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to do better with what we have right now. Uh, rather than stepping out and uh, passing new legislation. So you oppose the idea? Well, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the issue is the, they're trying to solve, but, but again, I'll listen to anything. We'll see where it goes in the legislature, um, but it uh, should be an interesting session. Is it a solution to a problem that doesn't exist? Don't, don't know that. I mean, that's something that, uh, that we'll take a look at, uh, and I'm sure it'll be debated uh, within the legislature themselves. Secretary Moore, you said TCI might not be a carbon tax if the proceeds are allocated for economic development and affordability. Is that, is that right? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see when the proposal comes out in sometime in December, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure what it is uh, at this point in time. But we have a seat at the table. Uh, we'll reflect on that. Uh, I've been uh, consistent in my belief that the uh, carbon tax isn't what Vermont needs. Uh, so I would not support it if it was a carbon tax. Okay. Thank you very much.